Hi guys, Mr. John here. In this video I'm gonna take my time and actually show you how do I calculate the transformer for a switch more power supply for a flyback power supply in this case using the software that I talked about in a previous video. Now, this is gonna be a single take video for a few reasons. First, I don't have time for editing. Second, files that come out straight out of the open broadcaster are quite small and that's nice because I have slow connection to internet and after I edit them together suddenly two files that are like say 200 megabytes each become one gigabyte I don't get it anyhow so let's start again in this video it's gonna be single take video so expect a lot of spelling errors and bloopers and whatnot because I ain't gonna edit them out so to start with we have our we know some stuff that what we know to start with we know what we want we want a 12 volt supply up to 3 amps I'm gonna use my 12 volt 3 amp flyback for simplicity and uh, so it will be simpler and quicker besides that besides knowing what we want what can I supply we know our mains voltage and that's about it that's the truth of the matter is that uh, <coughs> before you're gonna use that software which allows you to calculate the transformer you will need to have um, an idea what parts are you gonna use before you actually calculate the transformer what parts are you gonna use what parts do you need to have idea about is what your input rectifier will be what kind of bridge with what kind of ratings what kind of size bulk capacitor what kind of MOSFET for switching there RCD for the clamp across the primary RCD across the, for the clamp across the primary is actually it's gonna be very easy to calculate using the uh, using that software that allows calculating the transformer which I'm gonna show in this video if I ain't gonna forget about it also you're gonna need to have an idea what kind of ferrite core and bobbin you're gonna use and that's kinda sneaky because again you need to know this before you put uh, before you calculate the actual transformer but there is an easy way to meet, work around this problem which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later also you're gonna need to know what your output rectifier will be output filtering caps small passives resistor caps diodes across around the control chip for the control chip we're gonna use UC3844 just because I want to keep this video short and talk only about the actual transformer calculation for this particular supply. So, UC3844. So first thing we do is we go for the datasheet for this part. And we look some features. We don't need to read through all of the stuff. We need the datasheet open here because we're gonna need to know some parameters which are gonna be crucial for our uh, calculation. Those parameters are... Now let me go and go open this Flyback 6000 app. Link to which of course you'll see in the description below. Okay, so here you can see this window with a lot of stuff in it which actually is left over from the previous calculation so I'm gonna talk about why I chose these values and what. now first thing first remember I told you that you need to know how what kind of core do you need that you know what kind of core do you need before you actually calculate the transformer the work around that problem is to choose a core which is deliberately too large in this case you can see I've chosen E25137 now what you need to do is to go and choose the highest one which will fit just fine so we chose the highest core biggest core available now we go here and here it's pretty simple you can choose your input voltage minimum typical and maximum both AC or DC if you prefer to use DC instead switching frequency 
this value you can wiggle around to make sure that the um, that uh, the windings will fit on your transformer on the core that you've chosen reflected voltage not a pole I recommend you to hit auto here breakdown voltage for the switch for the switch again you need to pick a MOSFET before beforehand before you actually know what kind of current will be flowing through it if you live in 230 volt country I recommend you to go with a MOSFET which has breakdown voltage of 600 volts minimum for that you can I chose this transistor because I had laying around here is a parameter that I'm very interested in drain to source voltage 600 volts and RDS on of 0.54 ohms so we can go and you can see put these values in current density this determines uh, how dense the current will be in the wires and what that means is the software will calculate um, the necessary amount of wires in parallel to not exceed this value to keep it simple if you're gonna put your supply in a fully enclosed adapter kind of enclosure I recommend you running like 3 or 4 amps per square millimeter here you can see it says that with natural cooling one should choose 4 to 6 amps per square millimeter if forced air forced air cooling is used you can go up to 8 to 10 amps per square millimeters so you have an idea what this is about current continuity you can see again zero corresponds to discontinuous current this value determines what kind of mode your converter is going to be operating in is it going to be operating in DCM discontinuous current mode or CCM continuous current mode <coughs> for the simpler for a, if you're not too bothered just put zero there and make a DCM converter because it's quite easier to make loop compensation on and uh, it does not require a fast recovery output rectifier that's a funny thing about it if you are sure that your converter will never never enter continuous current mode you can go and use like 1N4001 slow as generic 60 hertz rated rectifier diet and it will be fine for the explanation why I think Danik will cover that in his video about um, DCM versus CCM he actually made quite a few videos already about the flyback power supplies which I recommend you go and watch because they're awesome so I kinda think he will cover that in that video if not I'm gonna make a follow-up to this one now current thre sensor threshold voltage this voltage you will see in the datasheet for the chip that you've chosen you see 3844 we scroll down to the current sense section and we look at this parameter maximum current sense input threshold typically one volt here you can see it so one volt here that's why this value is here why a diameter for the primary you need to know that again before you actually know will it fit or not but again yet again for this particular reason I that's why I told you that go and use the biggest core available and then it will fit just fine if it doesn't fit you you are you want too much from a flyback power supply if you can't fit it on this gigantic core you can the truth of the matter is that flybacks are usually used for small power or medium power applications if you want hundreds of watts you do not use flyback flyback is pathetic for this kind of large power outputs because uh, as you will see in a moment <sighs> long story short the secondary side peak currents are huge they can be four times your rated output current and that's no good so secondary windings here is our main prime main secondary 12 volts 3 amps forward voltage of the diode what is that about 
please refer to Dyer's data sheet for the actual current. Now, current that the diode is gonna see, is gonna see flowing through it is gonna be larger than our rated current. But for the sake of uh, simplicity, let's go and use three amps here. Go for the data sheet of the diode, which we don't know yet is it gonna fit or not. So again, we go and pick a diode which is deliberately larger. If you have a 12 volt output, it's a good idea to pick at least 60 volt reverse voltage rated diode. So you can go and use MBR 2080, 2090 or 2100. I bought 2100 because that's what I that's what that's the diode which was cheap. <laughs> and they didn't have any 2080s or 2090s in stock. So we have 100 volts of reverse voltage which should be more than plenty. Average current 10 amps per diode. There are two in a package. For the flatback you need only one diode. So you can use only one or go and join pins one and three together and get away with it because there are, the diodes are on the same die. Now if you have like, if you need a 5 amp diode but all you have is a 3 amp diode, do not put two 3 amp diodes in parallel and, and think that you will get away with it. No you won't. The truth of the matter is that non two parts are created equal and the only way that we're gonna be able to get away by joining these two diodes in parallel is because they're on the same die. They're about as close in parameters matching as you're gonna get. Two discrete diodes that you're gonna buy from a store ain't gonna be matched in any way, shape or form. And why is that a problem? Because let's say this diode is 500 millivolts voltage drop at whatever your current is. And this one is 550 millivolts voltage drop. If you join them in parallel without anything, just short out pins one and three. One of the diode, the one with the smaller voltage drop, this one 500 millivolts versus 550, is going to take more current than this one. Say you have two amps flowing through it, through this contraption. So this diode will take, let's say, 1.5 amps and this one will take like half an amp. See what I'm talking about. They ain't gonna share the current evenly, so you can't rely on that. But where do we get that voltage drop here? We need to scroll down to the graphs and look for the graph called typical forward voltage. Here, you can see number of curves, which are course for different junction temperatures you can you you should use junction temperature of 25 degrees because that will give you the highest voltage drop and here you can choose your current 3 amps see where it intersects right around here which is about 0.58 volts or something like that that's why this value is here diameter of the wire same as previously you don't know yet you can tweak that value later. Second second winding here is your auxiliary winding which provides power for the chip. Now I chose 15 volts although you do not really need it. What kind of voltage do you need for this winding? Well you go for the data sheet of the chip you chose and you look at power section or whatever it's called under voltage lockout section now you can see a couple of values here start up threshold which you which you don't have to worry about for this winding calculation because this voltage is going to be provided by the high value resistor called micro power startup resistor which is going to be which I ain't going to talk about in this video so do not worry about startup threshold you need to worry about minimum operated voltage operating voltage after turn on. For the UC3844 here, you can see that we need minimum typically 10 volts. Maximum it's 11 volts or something like that. So to be on the safe side, you need like 12 volts minimum. So you can use 12 volts for this winding and not 15. But I chose 15 because I was not thinking about it all that much. Operating current. I just chose 20 milliamps 
it's not all that crucial. This winding does not inter does not change the calculation much. Just make sure the voltage here is decent. 12 volts is going to be a good compromise for this chip. For voltage drop of the diode, the diode that is often used for that winding is the 1 and 41, 48. So you can just eyeball it and say 0.6 volts or something like that. Again, this winding is not that crucial. You can choose eyeball values right here on the second winding and it will be just fine. Diameter of the wire just whacked some 0.5 wire and that's that. Now for the interesting stuff. Value of the non-magnetic gap. This value will need to tweak around to make sure that everything works out fine. And how do we know that everything works out fine? After we filled everything right here. And we chosen the largest core there is. We need to look at the parameter here in the results of calculation, which is called winding field factor, which you can see is not 0.009, which is very, very small. This parameter should not exceed 0.3, not 0.3. But for the practical, for the handmade transformers, I really recommend you to never appro to not, do not let this parameter approach 0.3, because 0.3 is a ideal value, which is uh, calculated for the transformer, which is wound very neatly, and the windings are very evenly spread across the core and not sloppily wound like you normally would do if you wind them by hand. A good compromise is to try to keep this value right around 0.25. Here we see that it's very small. So what we need to do now, what this means is that our core, the bobbin on the core, is going to be how just bugger all windings on it. It's going to look empty and that's going to be ridiculous. So the core is way too large. So what we're going to use now is to go and choose a smaller core, let's say this one. You can see the fill factor is now a bit larger, but still it's a bit, this core is way too large. So we go and choose yet smaller core. Well, it's getting better. Now let's go one step down again and see what happens. Hmm, cool. So we are pretty close to 0.25, so we can use this core. Now, once we chosen the core in such a way that this is more or less decent, we need to put the value right here, which is going to be next largest value to the values that you can see here in the required non-magnetic gap. Required non-magnetic gap here is 0.329 millimeters, so you, the minimum value is 0.33, and if you're going to enter anything smaller than that, say 0.3, say 0.2 you can see attention the amplitude of the flux density is above the permissible select a larger value for the gap or select a larger core now we see that our core we saw that the winding field factor is less than 0.25 so we do not need the larger core but what do we need is to make sure that this parameter right here is larger than the one stated right here now you can go and make the gap, introduce the gap in the core yourself by inserting little shims, paper, tape, whatever. But you can also buy the cores with pre-existing gap. This ga core, for example, comes with a 0.4 millimeter gap, which is larger than this, but not by a huge amount, so that's nice. We enter that, we hit enter, and we see that no errors popped out, winding field factor is just fine so it's pretty much it our transformer is calculated but before i go any further i'm gonna demonstrate quickly why you do not why it's a bad idea to select a <coughs> gap in the core which is too large which is much larger than the one stated here take a look at this winding field factor remember the value and remember the value of the primary turns and remember the value of the peak currents through the transistor which is one end right here. Now let me choose 0.8 millimeters 
what's it changed? Winding fill factor is now 0.27, so we're getting close to practical limit. Primary turns are now 93 and not 73, and the peak current of the transistor did increase, but not by much. And if you get too big of a gap, winding fill factor is about ideal value. Calculate layout of the winder and select a larger core. So that means that you need to choose the gap here, which is next largest value, but not by a huge amount. The closest largest value is a good compromise. Again, if it says 0.33, use 0.4 that's a pretty much standard value I'm sure you can get it or you can use 0.5 that's the bog standard value and it still is fine you can see it's less than 0.25 you should be able to put your winding there so let's leave it at 0.4 and talk about the actual results of the calculation here you can see the results for the primary winding 73 turns Wire 0.3 times 1 means how much wires you need in parallel. One wire, which is 0.3 millimeters in diameter. And here you can see the current density calculated for that wire. 4.77 amps per square millimeter, which is less than this. Nice. But what happens uh, when we choose like 0.2 wire here for the primary? Is that you see that we need now two wires, two of these 0.2 millimeter wires in parallel, and the current density is over 5 amps. So what you need to do now is to go and increase this gauge of this wire, but still have a, take a look at the winding fill factor and make sure that it does not increase too much. Right now it's 0.201, and if you choose 0.3, it's 0.211, which is not too bad. It's a good compromise between the current density and the fill factor. Reflected voltage, voltage spike, we do not need to worry about that right now. Peak current of the, of the transistor is 1 amp. And remember, our transistor is rated for the DC rating is 10 amps, so that's not a problem at all. Resistance of the current sensor. That's a resistor in the source of the MOSFET, which is should be uh, 0.838 ohms. So the closest value, I think, will be 0.82 ohms, if that exists. <laughs> Or you can parallel something up. Use parallel series combo. Capacitor rectify minimum. What, that, what the hell is that about? It's your bulk capacitor. The capacitor is just gonna be on the output of the bridge which is connected to the main side. 70 microfarads minimum. So the next largest value is the value that you should use. 82 microfarads will do, you, will do you just fine. 68 is gonna be a little bit on the low side, but it's gonna be fine. You can actually use 47 or 68, but that will create too much ripple on the on that capacitor at full load, and not only that will cause some. Well, I don't know about stresses on the parts, but one thing that it causes for sure is the uh, increased amount of EMI, and believe me, you do not want that. Parameters here, input voltage, current consumption, duty cycle, current continuity. Here you can take a look and make sure that your converter does not enter, enter the constant co continuous current mode, as I talked about here. You can see zeros all over the place at minimum, rated and maximum input voltage. So we are fine, we can use a slow rectifier on the output, it will be just fine. And we can also see that the duty cycle right here, when the minimum input voltage is 0.3, which is 31% here. Now we need to make sure that this value right here is going to be smaller than the maximum duty cycle that our chip can put out. And for a UC3844, the maximum duty cycle it can put out you can find in the PWM section. Maximum, you can see it's about 48%, typically. And we're under that. So our supply, what well, that means, that it should be able to supply the given output, 12 volt 3 amps, even with minimum input voltage. Now, for the secondary windings, you can see 1, which is this winding, 2, this winding. 
that's our main secondary winding you can see that it uses seven it is seven turns wire but it uses 3.6 millimeters wires in parallel here you can again tweak this value right here to get the current density a bit lower than 5 amps you can use like 0.8 millimeter wire and then you will have to use less amount of fewer wires in parallel but again take take a peek once in a while in this winding fill factor and make sure it does not increase too much hit calculate we see that it is about 0.23 which is still less than 0.25 so it's still doable and now we need only two wires in parallel and the current density is now 5 amps very close to our rated cool so you can use 0.8 millimeter wire or even one millimeter wire then you still need two wires current density is nice and low but you can see current density is nice and low right so we're gonna have lower copper loss but at the same time take a look at our winding fill factor it just about theoretical will fit so see what the problem is here you cannot you have to do choose a compromise the sweet spot between the copper loss and the amount and the how much how how small the copper loss can you make so I chose 0.6 millimeter wire because that's what I had on hand the current density is a bit high but my power supply lives in open air and it has no problem with overheating plus I never load it up with 3 amps I load it with like 2 amps and right now it's actually not doing anything it's sitting in a box of projects in which it's gonna be forgotten for years to come second winding is our auxiliary winding 0.5 millimeter wire you can see the current density is very small so what we can do now is we can go and decrease the gauge of this wire like 0.2 you can see that the current density is still very small but see what it what it had to do with the winding fill factor previously with 0.5 millimeter wire it was 0.211 now that we use 0.2 which is more than planning for this winding we now save some space here so we can now go and try to fit one millimeter wire and see what happens 0.269 you might be able to fit it if you're really careful with the winding but i do not recommend you to go and approach 0.28 again 0.25 I can almost guarantee that the winding will fit unless you're real sloppy with your windings so a good compromise I'm gonna say it's gonna be 0.8 millimeter wire that's a beautiful amount right there actually you can save a little bit of space again by using even smaller wire for the auxiliary winding now the current density is quite a bit higher but it's still nice and now yeah you can see there is a limit to it so 0.8 millimeter wire here and 0.2 millimeter wire here is a sweet spot that i would would have used if i had 0.8 millimeter wires on hand so that's about it now for the snubber oh sorry for the clamp circuit across the primary now that you have all of these results of the calculations all you need to do is to go buy the core or if you have it already go at it and wind that um, wind and, and put those windings onto the core onto the bobbin <sighs> so you have two choices here you can split the primary you can leave the primary not split you cannot split the primary what is the advantage of splitting the primary by splitting the primary you can uh, have a lower leakage inductance which will make sure the which will let you uh, basically decrease the amount the voltage spike from the leakage inductance which you can see right here that's a maximum permissible voltage spike but ultimately by splitting the primary you put one and you put um, 
that wind, very noisy winding, which is connected to the drain of the transform, to the drain of the transistor on the outer side of the transformer. And what that means is that the EMI is going to be much worse. So for small power supplies, I now do not split the primary because it really helps to minimize EMI, to in minimize radiated EMI. For small power supplies, I mean like if I need a one walk flyback, I just don't see the point of splitting the primary. One, it makes the winding process a little bit more complex. Second, it increases EMI and for small power supplies, which are going to be used like standby power supplies for something, you really need to minimize EMI. You can sacrifice a little bit of efficiency. Since the power supply is going to be low power application, it's ain't going to be a big deal. So, now, now that you've chosen what uh, type you're going to use, will you split the primary or won't you split the primary? Say you split the primary, you wound it. Again, in this video I'm going to talk about how, what is exactly a split primary. Maybe in the next video, maybe. Long story short, after you made the transformer according to, to the data that you have right here, you hit R RCD clamper calculation and you see this window where you can see reflected voltage. That's a voltage which is automatically chosen right here. See? And uh, how, how do these voltages are calculated? You might end ask, how is 31 volts? What is that about? Well, how it's calculated is roughly it's uh, the whole idea is that the sum of the reflected voltage plus this uh, that the reflected voltage plus voltage spike from the leakage inductance plus rectified maximum input voltage here that sum of all those voltages should not exceed volts which is breakdown voltage of the switch right there so that's the whole idea here reflected voltage you leave it as is voltage spike on the switch you can choose it you can choose either it or you can choose the capacitor value now thing is with capacitors they come in standard value so sometimes it's a bit more useful to select a value of the capacitor that you have on hand or can purchase rather than the voltage spike of the switch so we can select that we leave this parameter as is because it's taken from the actual calculation right here as you can see switching frequency we leave it as is because it's taken off here leakage inductance now this parameter you can measure now that you have your transformer wound and ready to go what you need to do is you need to go and short out use a little use a li short little pieces of wire to short out the secondary and the auxiliary winding. After you do that, you need to put the primary winding on an inductance meter and the value that you're gonna read from that inductance meter is gonna be value of your leakage inductance of, your, of the transformer that you just made. Then you go and enter that right here. Equivalent capacity I did not change it because again it's a bit more tricky to calculate or measure so I did not bother so you leave it as is what you need to change here again is your leakage inductance which you need to calculate which you need to measure if you have an inductance meter now say you have a 10 nanofarad capacitor let's see will it fit our job remember that voltage spike of the from the LS leakage inductance should not be above 131 volts so we can go and tweak the value of this capacitor in such a way that the voltage spike on the switch should not exceed 131 volts let's put 10 nanofarads and see what happens it is 101 volts which is lower nice so 
what we can do now is to go with even smaller capacitor it's 111 nice let's use 4.7 see what happens 147 so which is more than 131 which is our maximum value what that means is 4.7 nanofarads ain't gonna cut it so we need minimum of I think 6.8 nanofarads yeah let's close the thing with this capacitor that you can snap the hell out of this voltage spike by installing a capacitor which is way too large which is gonna be 68 volts right now but look at the power that you're gonna dissipate on the resistor in the clamp circuit 5 freaking volts that is if you use slow diode which is considered a fast recovery diode and why is it considered slow? well because fast rectifier diodes are not as fast <laughs> it sounds ridiculous yes but than the ultra fast rectifiers or short key diodes with a fast diode like ultra fast rectifier you'll have almost 20 watts on the resistor and with a slow diode you will have 5 watts on the resistor you might be asking what the hell is going on here the thing is that this this fast recovery diode cannot recover as fast and thus some of the charge which is gonna be dumped from the leakage inductance on the capacitor in your RCD clamp because the diode is not cannot turn off that fast sorry because the diode cannot turn off that fast some of the charge from this capacitor is gonna be dumped in the second back into the primary on the uh, on the flyback cycle and essentially that energy will end up on the secondary side and provide useful power for you that's why the power on the resistor is lower with a slow diode than it is with a fast diode so it's a good idea really to use FR207 or something like that and if you're gonna snap the hell out of this spike by installing large capacitor you have 5 volts but you do not need that your switch can handle 600 volts it's not a good idea to approach it very close but you can approach it to like 500 volts and it's a good compromise between safe operation to make sure that the voltage on your switch is not gonna ain't gonna exceed the rated value or be close to it be uncomfortably close to that value but at the same time you do not want to have an excessive power dissipation on this resistor 5 watts 5 watts so you need a 7 watt resistor minimum and you have 68 volts of spike and you can afford 131 which you can see right here again so let's use lower value we now have 3.5 volts we can afford a little bit more voltage so let's use 8.2 nanofarads now it's 3 volts let's use even smaller value all right now we're pretty close 122 and we can afford 131 and the power on the resistor is 2.9 watts so you can use now a 5 watt resistor and it will be fine and dandy so that's the way you calculate RCD clamper for the primary and that's about it now I'm gonna go and have some cup of tea because ugh, my sorry throat from talking so much I hope this video made any sense to you because I'm not all that great about making explanations videos because as you as you saw number of times throughout this video I get carried away quite easily and uh, drift away from the points that I'm explaining yeah I hope that it made any sense to you thanks for watching see ya